Hi, I'm Stacy, and I'm a hardware design engineer and welcome back to my YouTube channel. So I came across one of the HDL bits challenges that I thought was really interesting and I thought I would share it with you. And there's some really cool things that we can learn from this one. So I'm going to go through it and we will see what we can find. So in this challenge, we want to switch the endianness of the bytes in this bit vector. So usually FPGAs are a little endian, but most CPUs are big endian. So if you have an interface between an FPGA and a processor, at some point you need to do an Indian swap. And so this is what this challenge is. Uh, and if you don't know what an Indian swap is, basically you take the bytes and you flip them around. So in a four byte vector, byte one becomes byte four, byte two becomes byte three, byte three becomes byte two, and byte four becomes byte one. And I'm going to show you the code in three different stages. So the first stage is like the beginner stage, which is the kind of obvious way, and then the second is the intermediate, and the third is the advanced. So this is the manually coded method where I've just put in the bit ranges for each byte. And this can be quite error prone. If you mess it up, if you get one of the ranges wrong, or if you something changes and you want to extend it, it can be a bit inconvenient to have to go back here and redo all of these bit ranges every single time that you want to make a change. So uh, this is the least recommended of the three. So this is the intermediate version where I have included the calculation for each range instead of hard coding the values. I have also used the negative colon syntax, which means that instead of it being most significant bit down to least significant bit, I have most significant bit on the left, but then the length on the right. So this minus colon indicates that I am t going down by eight bits from the most significant bit. And this is really useful if you don't want to calculate both sides. If you just want to specify the length of a vector and you don't want to have to work out the most significant bit and the least significant bit, then you can use the negative colon. And this way we can more easily see the pattern in the code so that we can easily pick up on areas that we make. But in this case, it is still fixed to being four bytes. So if I wanted to make it eight bytes, I would still have to extend this code. So this is a variation on the intermediate version where we use a parameter. So we include the byte size in the code so that we don't have to duplicate the eight everywhere. We just have the byte size parameter. And then if that changes, then it will easily scale. So this next option isn't necessarily the best. Uh, I have used both the intermediate version and this next advanced option in my code multiple times. Even now, there are times where it's fine to just have this method. If the interface isn't going to change in size, if it's fixed and you know it's not going to change and you don't really need scalability, then I'm definitely all for keeping it simple like this. I did talk about keeping things simple and not being too fancy in the previous video. And so definitely I always err on the side of simplicity. And if this is the implementation that works it, because you don't need to scale it, you're not going to need to add more bytes to the interface and it's going to work or you're at a beginner or you're intermediate and you don't really want to deal with more complicated code, then this is perfectly fine. I just want to show you what an advanced implementation that looks like that is scalable. It's also an introduction to what a for loop looks like and how for loops can be used to scale things like this. Yeah. So this is the advanced version. And what I'm going to be using is I'm going to be using a generate statement. So the generate keyword is actually quite descriptive. It describes the fact that I'm going to be generating code programmatically instead of writing it myself. And I'm going to be using a for loop to do that. So I have a generate variable called genvar. And this tells the synthesis tool that this is a special variable that's specifically for a generate statement that it's going to loop over. And then for every value of i, I am going to generate this line of code. So at the end of the day, it's going to look exactly like this. It's going to be identical to me coding all of these lines, except that I only have to give it a template for the kind of code that I want it to generate for me. And it will loop over this template 
and every time if for every different value of i it's going to generate a new output and so in this example the for loop is not iterating over time it's not iterating sequentially sequentially over time, it's iterating in parallel. So I am using the for loop to generate additional code as a shortcut so I don't have to write it. This is what for loops are used for in hardware description languages like the HDL and Verilog. They're not used to iterate in the normal way like you would in C. They're used to generate additional lines of code instead of having to write them. So in this case, it's exactly the same format as this, except I have i in place of this number. So instead of 4 times byte size minus 1, I have i times byte size minus 1. And so this is the shortcut way for generating these kinds of lines of code without having to explicitly code them. And this is useful if you have a bus that's going to be changing in length, or if you want to use this code repeatedly in other places in your code. For example, if you want to do this operation on a 8-byte bus in one place and a 4-byte bus on another place, you can reuse this code and package it up nicely so that you can scale according to what you need. And in some cases, this can be really helpful. But again, I'll repeat and say, this isn't necessarily better. There's nothing wrong with using a simpler method where things are a bit more hard-coded if they're more clear and you don't necessarily need the scalability that comes with the for loop. I just thought this was an interesting example of how one specific challenge can be solved in multiple different ways depending on level of ability and also use case in the final code. And it's also a nice way of demonstrating how a for loop works. So I hope that this is helpful for you and all of the code that I write is going to be available on GitHub so that if you want to download it and use it and try it out on your own or use it in a project that you're using, then you're welcome to go ahead and do that. Thanks so much for watching my video and I really appreciate you. And there's a Google form in the description if you want to fill it in and give me your feedback on what you think of my channel. Thanks very much. I really appreciate you guys. Bye! Thank you.